slide on top of the rib um, and then go in perpendicular at that angle. You don't want to make any angles like this because even if you're landmark correctly in your the center or second intercostal space and you go at a 30 degree angle, all of a sudden I bring in structures that I'm trying to avoid. So you want to go perpendicular to the chest, straight down, riding the top of the rib. Okay? So in summary, um, you need to act fast and aggressive. You recognize that it's a bridge, mid-clavicular line, second or third intercostal space, and above the ribs. Go okay. deep again. Okay. So you want to go until you feel the air is released. Okay. okay. So, so again, um, you will feel that, um, and and probably what's best is if you you get close to it, and, and particularly with a neonate, and if it's a really really noisy cabin, um, you want to get close to it so that you can experience the air coming out. If it's a big kid and you're on an airplane, you're going to hear it if you go. And the moment that you hear rushing air rushing out, you're going to advance the catheter in the chest. You're going to pull, take the needle out, and it's going to sit here. Okay, so the moment so you're going to hear it even with the needle in place. Uh, you will, yes. It's just like getting flashback um, when you're getting um, or when you're getting an ID. Okay. Yeah. So and that's going to landmark. And then once you take the needle out and advance it, um, you don't really have to worry so much because this, if it comes across some structures, it's probably going to be quite pliable and it might bend around it. So yes. Okay. Um, I had one other thought that I was going to bring up. Any questions? Do you leave it? Or do you your chest tube is in? So again, that's controversial. Um, you want to make certain that your chest tube is in the right position. You want to know that you have air leaked through your chest tube. If you're comfortable with the position, then you can pull this out. Absolutely. Again, confirming if your chest tube is working adequately well in the back of the helicopter is going to be difficult. At the back of the plane might be a little bit difficult. So some people would elect to keep it in. If it was if it was you and you give me a call and you say, hey Greg, I'm confident that the chest tube is working. I see that we got air in the trap. Um, I would say, let's pull it out. Um, if you weren't as comfortable, then I would say, well, let's just keep it in until you come to the hospital. Now, how do you secure it? Um, again, on YouTube, you can look at a, a million different ways. Um, it really doesn't matter how you secure it. Okay, secure it with tape, build it up. It really doesn't matter. Just make certain that it doesn't move and it's fairly, um, it's fairly secure. Okay. And that is all I have. Um, there was one more thing that I was going to bring up. If you pull it, you don't have to dress it with anything. Like you know, if you steel. yes, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely, because really you're putting a very small hole in here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, okay so um, technically, this is a very easy skill to do. It's easier than starting an IV. Um, the first time I've done this, um, I was a uh, an R1 in Calgary. It was my first day on the emergency rotation. I've never done this before, and he sent me in the room alone. And he said, "This is the landmarks. This is what you do." And I was nervous as hell doing it because you're putting a needle in a chest. And I think that's the um, apprehension that you all have to get over. But from a technical perspective, it's going to be one of the easiest skills that you're ever going to do, right? Much easier than starting an IV, easier than what BJ talked about, easier than establishing an airway. Um, it's a very, very simple skill. I think what's important is landmarking. If you landmark correctly, you will not get into trouble and, um, and figuring out what size of needle that you, that you need. The, the thing I was going to bring up is this, is before you act fast and, and act aggressively, you have to think about what patients are going to be at high risk to have air leak. And that's always got to be at the back of your mind, particularly when you're in the plane or the helicopter and really doing serial clinical exams is challenging at best because it's difficult to listen to the chest. So for the NEOs, um, what, what are your patients at risk from a NEO perspective? Yeah, meconian aspiration is a big one. Yeah. <coughs> Any kind of aggressive, like higher pressures, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Stiff lungs. Yeah. 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 Sure, yeah. And and as important, and it probably doesn't happen as much here because our RT support and um, our teams are there right away. But when you're going to a resuscitation in, in nowhere in Manitoba and the neonate's been resuscitated for three, four hours, either they are under peeping or pressurizing the kid significantly or over, right? And so I would be very, very weary for prolonged or um, resuscitations or if it's taken you a while to get to wherever you need to go and, uh, and a team is managing a neonatal that, uh, or neonate that typically doesn't. So exactly, those are the, those are the those are the patients for a, a pediatric perspective. 
Typically, it's your AD, ARDS kids, your kids that are on peeps of 12 or 14, like the drowning that we brought the other day from Churchill. Those are the kids that are at high risk. So you know then, before you even board a plane, that you have somebody who's at high risk. So in the back of your mind, you're thinking, okay, if things go south acutely, and I know that the endotracheal tube hasn't moved, and this kid goes into respiratory distress, or, or the pressures drop significantly, you're, re you're already a step ahead of the game. And like our kids, and I'm sure the neonates do this as well, if they're jet ventilator or on the oscillator, we have a peep buster at bedside because we're already suspecting that this kid is at high risk for, for air leak. And so already for a kid that you're picking up from a coding aspiration, you should have an 18 gauge ready to go at all times just in case. Okay? The one thing that um, they'll talk about, um, and it's part of the policy, is using aseptic techniques. That's all lovely and cozy, um, but when you're in the, uh, in the air, sometimes we throw those precautions out of the air. It's the same thing as when we start central lines in an emergency and a kid is crashing in front of us. Our cleanliness is not so cleanly sometimes. And so if you do have time to take a swab and to do your three washes for 30 seconds in a <laughs> clockwise position, expanding the radius, that's wonderful. Um, but if not, then nobody's going to comment that, uh, that why didn't you use aseptic technique. We can treat that with antibiotics, um, but I'm sure the kid's going to have bigger problems coming home rather than not doing a little dipsy doodle on the, on the chest. Transport clean. Yes, the transport clean, exactly. I'll pull a swab out of the drawer. Yes, okay. So, very, very easy skill. It's the first time you do it, it's going to be like, oh my gosh. But um, if you landmark correctly, um, there is nothing really that can go wrong in most instances. <laughs> it has to be passed out for all the anxiety. Like all the time. Is this in your sink? 